Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 26. Glory be to thee, O Lord. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces corn. First, the stalk, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. As soon as the grain is ripe, he put the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the bears of the air can perch in its shed. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parables. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. And I just want to encourage you to uh, keep your Bibles handy as we look at this passage together. And I wonder, just to begin with a question, how many of you were raised on a farm? How many of you? Yeah, Kevin? Yeah? Very interesting. Today we are becoming an urban and suburban culture. Many of us have lost the appreciation for agriculture. But when Jesus was teaching people over 2,000 years ago, every listener was familiar with planting seeds and harvesting crops. They couldn't just run down to Tesco, Lido, Aldi, Morrison, Asda, or Sainsbury to pick up food. No processed food, no microwave. They only ate what they could produce. That is why so many of the parables of Jesus are about plants and seeds. My daughter Chimdoto cannot stay without watermelon. And often asked me, Dad, the seed is tiny. Why? I responded, it is very tiny inside, but mighty outside, and they are created by God. In verses 26 to 32, the Bible said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself, the soil produces grain. First, the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the bears of the air 
can perish in his shed. A seed is a mystery. Jesus said a farmer plants a seed, but he doesn't know how it grows. There was a man in my church when I was doing my apostolic work in my theological training who had a PhD in agricultural science. I recall him talking about this verse once. He said, and I quote, Jesus said, we don't know how a seed grows. That is no longer true. We know exactly how it grows. Heat and moisture cause the seed to germinate. It sends roots downward for moisture and shoots upwards towards the sun. We know how a seed grows, but we don't know why a seed grows. Only God knows that. End of the quote. Seeds are mysterious and mighty. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that is planted. Let's notice three ways in which God's kingdom is like a mysterious, mighty mustard seed. In verse 31, number one point is God's kingdom starts small. In verse 31, Jesus said, it is like a mustard seed which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. The mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world. Do you believe that? Yeah? Do you believe that? But it was the smallest seed with which people in Israel were familiar. It is tiny. You could put 200 mustard seed on the face of a penny. Yeah? Once there was a group of tourists visiting a city in Europe. One of the tourists asked the guide, were there any famous men born in this city? The guide said, no, nope. only babies. The kingdom of God started with a baby placed in a manger in Bethlehem. Even when Jesus died, the kingdom was still small. God specializes in taking small, insignificant things and making them mighty. After the te first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, the Jews returned from the exile and started to rebuild the temple. They had very little money and a few materials. There were many who doubted the temple could be rebuilt. But Zerubbabel, the governor, believed that it would happen. The prophet Zechariah wrote these words on the day that Zerubbabel laid the first stone in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. And it says, Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Never despise the day of small beginnings. Years ago, on a snowy evening in this country, a young teenager was trying to find his church building. Due to the blinding snow, he turned instead into a little Methodist chapel. The preacher didn't make it that night due to the weather. And there were only a handful of people there. One of the men of the church stood up and spoke on one verse from Isaiah. Look unto me and be saved on the ends of the earth. At that moment, a mustard seed of faith was planted in the heart of that teenager for the first time. And his name was Charles Spurgeon. Who would later go on and preach the gospel to thousands and build a 5,000 seat 
auditorium in London that was never big enough to accommodate the crowds. The number two point, God's kingdom grows steadily. Jesus continued in verse 32, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. The mustard plant can grow to a height of 15 feet. That is a huge plant from such a tiny seed. The same is true of the kingdom of God. From the tiny beginning of the kingdom in a baby in Bethlehem, God's kingdom has grown remarkably. The church of the Lord Jesus started with only a few people and has grown into a global family. Jesus called two of disciples to make up his inner core of believers. And one of those was a spiritual dropout. We know the story of Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. He told them to change the word. On the day of Pentecost, these 11 disciples were joined by 109 other people who were praying in the upper room. The Bible says in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120 in Acts chapter 1 verse 15. These 120 folks prayed for 10 days and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and filled the disciples. Peter preached a Pentecostal sermon and the Bible says those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Almost overnight, the church grew from 120 to 3,000 and then to 5,000 in a matter of days. Today, there are about 2 billion people or more that claim to be Christians. Is that right? Now, let's look at the figures, probably in China. For instance, consider what God is doing in China. In 1949, it was estimated there were less than 400,000 Christians in China. Today, a conservative estimate is that there are 163 million Christians in China. That means there are more Christians in China than the United Kingdom and U.S. But this number only represents 12% of China's population of 1.4 billion people. Is God doing something? We have to spread the gospel. God's kingdom will continue to grow until one day in heaven there will be a multitude too large to count. John described this vision he had of the throne room of heaven in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. And he says, After this I looked and there before was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I am looking forward to that day. What about you? Yes. We're going to sing. It doesn't matter your culture or background. We're going to be there praising God. Hallelujah. The growth of God's kingdom isn't only true in terms of numerical growth of the church but God's kingdom grows in you as well so the question is what is the kingdom of God usually when you think of a kingdom you think of thrones armies and nations but Jesus thought there are two aspects of the kingdom of God there is the future kingdom when Jesus will rule and reign over the whole earth when he returns. But for now, the kingdom of God is within us. And just as the seed grows, 
we grow towards Christian maturity. Are you growing in the Lord? Are you? So what is the kingdom of God? The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul reminded the Christians in Rome that God's kingdom is not about religious observance, liturgies, canticles, what to eat or drink. It's about the righteousness we receive in Christ. It's about the inner peace we enjoy through Christ. It's about the overflowing joy that we have in Jesus. Like a mustard seed, there should be a growing awareness of righteousness, peace, and joy in our lives. But there's one other way in which the mustard seed illustrates God's kingdom, which is the final point. God's kingdom offers shelter. Is that right? Of us shelter. In verse 32, Jesus described the mustard plant with such big branches that the base of the air can perch in its shed. There is a spiritual application here. Is that right? Just as the mustard seed provides shelter for the birds, we find protection and shelter in God's kingdom. Hallelujah. In Jesus, we have everything. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, here now is the time. Make peace with him. Tomorrow might be too late. The Bible says in Psalm 91 verse 1, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. In God's kingdom, you will find rest from the weariness of life. It gives us hope. Hope of internal life. Hopes that goes beyond here. Hope of eternity. So the question here is, are you tired? Weary? Jesus has a personal invitation to you. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 29, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is asking you to come to him. Let him be your Lord and Savior. Just as the birds find rest and shelter in the mustard plant, we can find rest for our souls in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. He's the true vine. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Can you imagine the life of a little bird? They fly around, but they can't stay in the air forever. They need a place to land and rest. Does that describe your situation this morning? Does that describe you? Where are you this morning? And that's the question I want to leave with you to ponder. Where are you this morning? Are you here to see Jesus? To encounter him? Are you here to see Jesus? To receive him into your life? To be your Lord and your Savior? We don't know 
what tomorrow might be. We don't even know what is going to happen in the next hour. But if there's one thing we must do now is to make peace with Jesus. Be in tune with him. Because one thing about this life is that we are going to give account, isn't it? On the last day. And nobody knows who is going to be the next. Could be me or you. But the most important thing is to make sure that we finished well. Yeah? Let the seed of Christ Jesus grow in you to touch others to know Jesus. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you again for your word this morning. The Bible says that the entrance of your word brings life, transformation. Let that seed grow in us. That we might know you, Jesus, and know the power of your resurrection. Become the doers of your words and not only the hearers. Have your way, Lord. And for those who don't know you, Lord Jesus, we bring them before you. May they encounter you this morning in a special way. That their life will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen.